Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back. I hope you all had a nice break and managed to rest during this period. Today, we are here together for the first webinar of the new year organized by School Education Gateway. My name is Marta, and I'm pleased to host this webinar today. Just a practical information for the audience, uh, the webinar is recorded and the recording might be used for dissemination purposes. And if you have questions and answers, please post them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session at the end. Today's focus is educational activism, how teachers can empower school students. And I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker today, Rares Poiku who has been an activist for schools students' rights for over five years, having worked at the local, regional, national, and currently international level, as a board member of the Organizing Bureau of the European School Students' Union. He is passionate about enabling young people to understand the importance of speaking up and defending their rights. He is currently part of the European subgroup on Pathway School um, pathway to school success, and he is also pursuing the Global Law Bachelor at Tilburg University in the Netherlands. So without further ado, I would like to welcome you, Rares. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much, Marta. Can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Amazing. Thank you so much um, for inviting me. Thank you so much for the amazing introduction uh, you have you have given me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see you all here, and I'm very glad to see that we have a lot of attendees for what is um, or, or what might seem at first a very a very specific topic to to tackle. Um, and I'm very happy to to know that that most of you, the attendees, are, are teachers, and it's it fills me with joy to to know that teachers are actually interested in helping their students um, uh, raise their voice and fight for their rights and self-organize. But this is something we're going to be to be um, delving into um, a bit further into the webinar. But um, as, as Marta said, my name is Darej Voiku. Uh, I'm from Romania originally. I'm from Bucharest. Uh, I'm 19 years old uh, and I'm currently in my first year of university. I'm doing I'm doing law in the Netherlands and I am um, a board member of the Organizing Bureau of European School Students Unions. We are the only European organizations uh, organization that represents um, the rights of school students at the European level and we are a platform for collaboration for school students at the European level. We have um, member organizations in, in uh, most of, of the European states. Um, and I'm very, very um, glad to be to be here with you once again. Um, but without any further ado, um, I think we can we can delve into into the, the topic of the webinar, which is, as you all know, educational activism. More precisely, how can teachers, so how can you empower school students? Um, but first of all, I think it's it's very important to um, delve into the topic by giving a bit of a definition to to all of this, because for for most of you, it might seem maybe as a very new concept or something you haven't really heard of um, before up until this point. Um, so the first the first part um, has been fulfilled, the fact that you want to learn more about this, but now actually delving into what education activism is. So there isn't a single definition for education activism that we could pinpoint and say, yes, this is what activism means. This is what uh, what's what the essence of activism uh, what, um, or the essence of activism is. Um, but to, to sum it up very, very uh, clearly and concisely, um, I would just say, first of all, that activism is not something um, at first, it might seem like something maybe disruptive or something that can have negative connotations, but that's not the case. Um, and I would first like to, to start by telling you that um, activism is for everyone, and especially school activism is for everyone. It's for teachers, it's for school students, it's for parents. So basically, the entire school community can take, take part in, in school activism. So what does this precisely mean? Basically, school activism means getting engaged, again, as a school student, as a teacher, as a parent, at a school level, to better um, the educational uh, climate and the educational, um, um, educational act at a school level. So it, it basically means fighting for, for the rights of school students, for the rights of teachers, for a better educational system at a school level, and maybe even at, the, at higher levels, at government levels, um, at policy-making levels, um, so it's 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 very much so 
based on, on a community and on the sense uh, and on the need of the school community to um, yeah, to, to fight for 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 the rights of its of its stakeholders and to fight for the for the betterment of the educational system. Um, so to sum it up, education activism is a fight, um, and it might seem a bit aggressive to say fight at first, but as we'll see further along the webinar, um, you shall find out that sometimes it really can be a fight. And I'm sure that in your experience as teachers um, at at a school level, you've oftentimes um, faced a lot of problems, maybe lack of resources or maybe outdated curriculum that no longer serves the interests of your of your students or is not uh, um, updated to the needs of society. And maybe sometimes you felt powerless or sometimes you felt as if uh, there's nothing you can do to to better the educational system in your country, to better the school that you work in or the schools that you work in. Um, that isn't true. So. What we're going to explore today is the opportunities that you have, first of all, um, to, help your, to help your students raise their voice and fight for a better educational system for us all. And then second of all, how can you actually get involved and you know, um, speak your mind and, and raise your voice and uh, make sure that uh, the, your needs and the needs of your students are actually heard, taken into account and, um, and cared for, because that's what this is all about. So this is what um, education activism means. Um, but moving further along, we'll find out that a big part of educational activism and fighting for a better educational system takes part in a in a bit of a of a, of a broader framework, what we like to call school democracy. So the second question, of course, is um, what does school democracy mean? And I think it's a bit of a, of a natural question. It's not a term that we come we come across very very often. Um, but just so to to make sure that we all have the same understanding, I'm sure that we all know what democracy means. So it basically means um, a state or, or a country or a government which is um, ruled by the people through um, an elected representative or through elected representatives. So basically it means the power of the people, if we were to translate it from, from Greek. Um, and if we are to put that in the school in, in, the, in the school context, it basically means the same thing. So a school that is led by its constituents, by its members, by, by school students, by teachers, and of course, uh, by, by the parents of, of the students. Um, and it's very important to have this concept in mind and to start this webinar and to start this, this journey towards school activism with very, this very, very clear uh, concept in, in your head that schools and school communities in general um, must be led by their um, constituents, by, the, by their, their, their stakeholders, be, be them teachers, be they um, school students, or again, um, parents. So in this context, in the context of school democracy, we of course have all sorts of different mechanisms um, that are in place to ensure this democratic way of, 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 uh, of running a school. For most of us, it might be, for most educational systems, it might be a school board, which is made up of you know, representatives of teachers, of school students, of parents, um, and which make decisions on, on, on the school budget, on, or the school timetable, on um, how the school should function, like the, the long-term strategy of, of, the, of the school management. Um, so we have all these sorts of bodies and organisms at a, at a school level, which make decisions on behalf of the, of the teachers or of the students. So it's only natural to pose the question, how democratic are these uh, organisms in reality, and how um, how much do, do they truly really represent what school students want, what teachers want, what parents want, and how much do they actually fight for a better educational system? So this is the question that we're we're starting from, um, because we've seen all over Europe, in almost all of the member states of the EU, we've seen a great reduction in democratic spaces. Less and less people go out to vote in elections, um, less and less people uh, make their voices heard or want to make their voices heard, um, less and less people um, actually have the opportunity to talk to decision makers, be they uh, members of parliament or local authorities or, or whatever of, um, other action of the sort. Um, and it's, um, it's a very grave situation that we're in because democracy can only survive and democracy can only move on if we, its subjects, actually get involved and actually speak up for our rights and actually keep those who are in power, um, if we keep them accountable for their actions and if we actually get involved to um, steer this, this very um, unstable ship that democracy can sometimes be. 
But so now that, that we've given <laughs> quite a comprehensive uh, definition of, of school democracy, um, and also we've defined what the democratic processes at a school level are. So we're talking about school boards, we're talking about um, administration councils, we're talking about advisory councils at the school level. So any sort of mechanism through which school students and teachers can actually take part in decisions that are being made at a school level. This is what we mean by school democracy. And so now the question is, how well do these bodies actually function? How well do, um, how well are your opinions or, and your reviews and your wishes actually represented in these bodies? Um, and for this reason, I would like to invite you to um, um, fill out a Mentimeter. I don't know how we should do this right now. Uh, Eleonora, should I share my screen with the Mentimeter or can you open the, the link? Yes, I'm going to share my screen, Radish. Thank okay. you. Thank you. So the question that you, you're going to be to be asked to answer is if you take part in democratic processes in your school. So that can mean um, to have a, a definition that can mean either getting involved in the school boards or um, talking to the principal of your school about issues that affect you and your students. Um, it can also be about um, yes, fighting for your rights and, and speaking up when, when things uh, go wrong. I don't know if you can see the, the code for joining. Uh, We're going to post it. Ah, OK, OK. The Menti code will be posted just in a minute in the group, in the, in the chat of the meeting. Yes, yeah, so you have you now have the the link in the chat. Radish, can you post the code yourself, please? Yes, just thank a you. I've just sent the code in the, in the chat as well. Um, so please go to menti.com, so M-A-N-T-I.com uh, and use the code that I just posted in the chat. Um, yeah, so basically what, what we're referring to in this, in this context is um, whether or not, again, you have run for a position on your school board, um, you have, um, encourage your students to run for, for positions and for such position in the in the school board. If you voice your opinions, if you've filed petitions with the school administration for something that was going wrong. Um, so we see a very interesting um, division. So two respondents so far always take part in democratic processes in, in, in their schools. Uh, one person sometimes takes part in takes part in these processes and two people never take part in such in such processes. Um, the Menti is still open, so please um, continue answering so we can have a bit of um, a bit of a perspective on the topic. I'm gonna post the, the code again in the in the chat so it's accessible for everyone. Okay, so the percentages have, have changed quite a bit. Uh, so far, out of 15 people who have answered, eight people always take part in democratic processes in schools. Uh, five people sometimes take part in, um, in these processes and two people never take part in them. I'm gonna post the code again. Maybe uh, Mrs. Dulkeru, maybe you can see it now. Okay, can we have one last refresh for the page and then go back to the presentation, please? Oh, actually, no, because there is another um, another slide. But, uh... Okay, so the, the percentages, uh, as we see them right now, are, are quite good. Um, I'm very happy to see this, that most of you who have answered have um, 
actually do get involved at least sometimes in democratic processes in, in your school. And most of you do that on a constant basis. Um, so for the for the final um, part of the session, maybe we can actually talk a bit about what these bodies actually are and what they consist for you. And we can have a little a little discussion at the at the end of the session to see how these bodies actually work in your in your country and how um, we can learn from one another in, in uh, the practice of getting involved in these uh, in these uh, processes. OK, um, thank you so much for your answers. You can um, keep answering and we will make this this Menti slide available to you uh, after the meeting. I think that can be that can be arranged. Um, but so now. Now that we talk, we talk, we've talked about uh, democratic process in, in schools, um, we're going to circle back a bit to the to the um, uh, main topic of this webinar, which is how you teachers can actually help students and empower students to get involved in, in such processes and to speak their minds, to speak up for their rights and to self organize in such a way that allows them to um, actually be able to to defend their rights and to fight for a better educational system which actually caters to their needs and which actually has um, has them as the the main actor in the in the center of um, of their education so um, i'm sure that many of you have worked with or have at some point supported um, school students councils uh, regardless of the level, be it at a school level, at a regional level, at a local level, I'm sure that most of you have heard of or have worked with these sorts of councils. They are maybe one of the most basic forms of student organization that you can that you can yeah that we can find in schools. Um, and I'm very curious to to see apart from these students councils, um, what are the methods that you have used so far to encourage your students to speak up? So what are the methods that um, you have put in place up until this point to actually encourage them to be a part of the school community, to ask questions, to voice their opinions, to fight for their rights. Um, so we're going to stay on this mentee. The code is the the code is the same. But we have another another slide, and this is uh, a slide with open questions. So you can actually um, fill in the answer by yourself and just say what are the methods that you use to empower your students to make their voices heard. Um, I don't know, be there. You can share resources with them um, about how they can self organize or you can offer them support and create an, an organization. Um, there are a lot of ways to do it, but I would like to hear from you. And maybe this can also serve as, as a space for exchanging good practices and how you help your students um, make their voice heard. OK, so we have someone in the chat who said that they use Google Forms. Uh, yes, again, this can also be for example, because I suppose that you use Google Forms for feedback, uh, maybe after lessons or after a semester. So that is also um, a way of making um, your students' voices voices heard. It could be, again, through uh, feedback at the end of each lesson or feedback at the end of a semester. So we're talking about various degrees of, of making their voice heard and various ways of doing it as well. So uh, right now the, the floor is yours uh, to to tell us a bit more about this. So in the chat on, on Teams, we also have a few other answers. Um, someone said debates, debates at a, at a classroom level, which uh, is, is very, very good through poster making and using create, creative depictions, debates, critical thinking methods, hasn't changed the slide on Menti. Uh, OK, I think maybe now it should. Yeah, I think now it should work. Apologies for that. It was an error on my, on my side. But now you should see the slide on Menti as well, and you can put your answer there. Thank you for pointing that out. OK, so uh, we see debates, poster making, critical thinking methods. So I'm very, very, this actually makes me very, very happy to see that uh, teachers are actually doing um, such things. Um, and it's very, very important um, to have debates at a classroom level because it helps school students actually develop their arguments and help them indeed, as, as someone said, uh, develop their critical thinking methods and critical thinking skills. Uh, and it's amazing and I'm encouraging you from the bottom of my heart to keep doing these. Um, 
self-organized students projects, create students at activities, voting process, conversations in our classroom, um, public speeches like tech talks. We use debate and tools to vote, such as Google Forms. This is this is amazing to hear and to see. I'm very, very happy that you're all doing this. Um, and we shall see further down the, the presentation that this is an amazing way to do it. And it's a very big part of actually helping students, first of all, uh, develop as adults and as function adults in a democratic society. And also, you might have the surprise that um, if you do these kinds of these kinds of things, so debates, uh, encourage critical thinking, show them TED talks, make posters, and help them express themselves through cre creative means, you might have the surprise that at one point your classroom and your students are a lot more active because they have this exercise of speaking up, they have this exercise of, of talking in the classroom, so they're not afraid to voice their opinion or to answer your questions um, without being afraid that they might be wrong, because that is a very big part of, of, um, of why students might not sometimes speak up, because they're scared of judgment, um, they're scared of being wrong, and this is something that um, um, teachers should learn to, to, to nurture, um, that being um, letting go of the fear of, of being wrong, because only through being wrong can we can we understand sometimes. So presentations, watching some videos, using social media, um, express their opinions by helping them become media literate and digital literate. Um, I tell them to stand up for their rights when there is an unjust and arbitrary rule imposed by the school. Encourage to be active in school or and social problem solving. Cooperation of students with students from other countries. Someone said in the chat, slogan writing. Yes, this is this is amazing. Thank you so much for the contribution. It's it's again heartwarming to see that that this is actually happening. And um, I'm sure that so far, um, and again, maybe we can also talk about this a bit at, at the end um, in a bit more more open format. Um, I'm sure that you've seen so far that having these debates and having these conversations with your school with your students has not in any way diminished the degree of authority that you have in the classroom so just because you're closer to your students and because you actually help them think and develop their critical thinking skills um, that can actually strengthen your relationship with your students and it might actually make them more open to to your lessons to uh, learning and it, it's going to make and I can tell that from experience because I've had teachers who have done um, similar, similar, who have used similar methods. Um, it makes it a pleasure to come um, to come to these classes. So keep doing what you're doing because uh, the, you're uh, you're on the right path. Um, so organize campaigns, poster making. Again, uh, Leonora, if you could uh, translate that that one uh, in the middle there. Uh, Primersi. My Italian is not uh, it's not that good. I must I must say. No, but I I suppose the same person repeated debates because ah okay it's okay. indeed debating yeah and it did and okay. uh, here we have uh, um, express uh, their ideas with critical thinking and freedom. Oh yeah, that's a very that's a very good concept to uh, to pass on to to school students the concept of freedom and what it means for us in a democratic society. So the Mentimeter again is going to is going to stay open until the, the end of the session so you can keep um, adding your contributions and this will be shared so you can also um, after the session is done and after mo more people have put in their contribution you can also l take a look at it and see what else you can do in your classroom as inspiration and as an exchange of, of good practices. Um, thank you Lenora for, for sharing this. Uh, can we go back to the presentation please? Okay. Um, yes, so coming back to the, the presentation, this is the part where we talk a bit about um, 
what school democracy actually means for school students. And this is students' participation and activism. Um, and as I told you earlier, I'm sure that for the most of you, uh, or that most of you have already interacted with some sort of organization led by students, be it a student council, be it a student board, be it a, a small student association. Um, so we're talking about um, these sorts of organized uh, means in which students make their voices heard. But we can also talk about individual students which which choose to become act who choose to become um, activists at a school level. So we, we can be talking about um, students who separately take their issues up with the school administration and want to make their voices heard and to to voice their opinions and to say what the issues are within the school. Um, and I think it's a it's it's a shame because this happens um, very little these days um, in terms of how often students actually have the courage to go up to the principal or go up to the school board and actually voice their opinions and voice their complaints about what is happening in, in, in their school. And this happens mostly because um, they're afraid to do so. This is something we're going to tackle a bit a bit further down the presentation. Um, but just to, to give you um, a very short example of what a school, yeah, what a school students council um, looks like or what its values are at, at its core. Um, so students councils are, of course, as their name says, councils of students. So organizations which are created oftentimes and most of the times led by students themselves. And they serve as, as a forum, as a platform for students to collaborate, uh, to share their opinions, to share their ideas. And then at the end, for them to be able to take uh, a unitary opinion um, as an organization up with a school board or up with a school principal. So what is very important to, to understand is that most of these school councils, the, the vast majority of school councils, um, of, of students' councils, um, function to democratic means. So they are based on free elections, on open elections for which any school student can, uh, can run and can be elected. Um, and most of the decisions in these um, organizations are made based on voting. So it's, it's democracy at its best. It's the essence of democracy, if we could say so. So it's very important to remember that these organizations, when they come up with a request or when they they come they uh, they point out an issue that's um, uh, present in, at a school level, they're not talking for themselves. They're talking for the entire school student's body, and it's very important for them to be heard because again, they're not representing themselves, or it's not only I don't know the president of that uh, of that council that. Uh, um, voices their opinion, and it's not their personal opinion, but it's the, the opinion of all the students in the in the school. So it is precisely why it's so important for these councils to exist and for them to be taken seriously, because they might be seen sometimes as as being uh, somewhat trivial or um, not being so important. But in fact, these councils actually represent the voice of the entire um, of the entire student body. So basically half the school or more than half the school has an issue with a certain with a certain topic or issue with with a, with a certain um, with a certain thing. So in that moment, it's it's important to know that um, the, the, the students council uh, is the one voicing that issue with uh, with a principal or with, with a certain teacher or with um, the school administration. And that's why they must be taken seriously as well. But as I as I as I pointed here in this Venn diagram, um, a student council is based on three main values, uh, or has three main um, topics or um, ideas on which it, it is based on. The first one, and the one which is maybe the most important, is independence. The reason why this is so important is because, as I told you earlier, we're talking about an organization that represents the entire student body. So basically, I don't know. 100, 200, 300 students, as many as there are in that in that school, they're all represented by this one students council, which is why it's so important for the students council to be independent and for its members to be independent, both from political parties or from uh, um, um, teachers interferences or anything that's want to change their decision making processes. So these school students councils must be independent. So if you're a teacher and you're dealing with a school students council, that's amazing if you support them and you empower them, which are the other two pillars, but you must never ever interfere with, with their decision making processes because um, then it's not really a students council anymore. It's more of a, 
hybrid version between a student's and a teacher's opinions council, and that is not what, what uh, uh, students' empowerment means, not at all. And so the other two uh, values or, or ideas that this, um, this form of students, student organization is based on is empowerment and support. And this is where you, teachers, come in. Um, so we're talking about, again, about empowerment and support. What this means is that you as teachers and as, as esteemed figures, both in the classroom and within the school, have the opportunity to empower your students and have the power to empower your students to um, speak up for their rights, to create these, these students' councils if they're not already created or to get involved in them if they're already uh, in place at the school level. Um, and um, last but not least, to also give them that tiny bit of courage they need to speak up um, and, and raise their voice and raise the issues that affect them without having a fear that they will be punished or that they will, they will have some sort of, of, of bad consequences afterwards, that they will get a, a bad grade or they will be kicked out from the school just because their vo they voiced their opinions and because they, um, they said that something is not working as it should within the school. So this is where you come in, both to empower them and to, to actually convince them to speak up for their rights and support. Support means that um, you support them both at a personal level and that you help them with any questions that they might have because students might not always know, I don't know, what the principal must do or what the, the administration council or the, or the school the school council uh, or the school board must do. And this is where you come in to help them understand better what these uh, what these bodies do, how they can they can address them, how they can formulate a petition or a letter to the to the principal. So this is where where your knowledge and your where your um, experience as teachers and your life experience comes in and supporting those students actually understanding what tools they have to make their voices heard through democratic uh, mechanisms and through uh, democratic means. So this is very, very, very important. Um, so basically, with, without any of these three pillars that you see on the screen, we can't really talk of a well-functioning, relevant, representative um, school students, uh, school students councils. But then we have these three pillars, and this is what it ideally looks like. So. Um, uh, independence, empowerment, support, and then the the question is, and here I'm going to talk a bit from my from my own experience as a school as a school student representative um, about how it really is. So um, coming from Romania, um, I was the president of the school students council in my school, and then at the local level, and then I was the president of the national school students council, representing over two million school students. And what I've seen every step of the way is that uh, I see that someone said in the chat, um, Calypso said in the chat that students' councils are occasionally influenced from political parties. That sometimes can be true. Um, however, at the school level, and this is what our webinar is addressing, this is a bit more unlikely. Uh, most of the times at a school level, the issue is that that's, um, these councils and school students um, who raise um, issues or who are active or who are activists face is first of all again the fear of punishment uh, either by teachers or by the principal or by the school community um, and they feel like if they speak up or if they voice their opinions they're doing something wrong and then um, I can tell you from experience that when I was 15 or when I was 14 and I just gotten into high school and I got involved in a student's council I almost felt like um, I was the black sheep of the school. So I was that person that uh, teachers always looked down upon because uh, we were seen as always wanting to create a scandal or to uh, be against everything and, and some, yeah, things of the sort, which cannot be further from the truth. This is, this is not true at all. Um, every school student representative that I've met in my life so far, and I've been doing this for five years, um, has been willing and wants to work with teachers, wants to work with the school board, with, school, with the school administration to make things better in the school and to make things better for school students as well uh, within the school community. So um, if there's anything you take away from this webinar, and I think there's, I think there's almost 100 teachers in this webinar, if there's anything you can take away from here, um, just at a, at, a, at, a, at a first glance is the perspective that you have on, on students' councils. 
So they are not made up of these naughty students that only want to create disruptions and again scandals in schools. They're created by young people who have decided to, to speak their minds and by young people who have decided to, to fight for their rights. And uh, in my opinion, it's your duty as teachers to support them and to help them um, again, know what their rights are, fight for these, for, fight for these rights, because um, at the end of the day, it is also your, your role as teachers to form adults and to train adults that can be a functional part of society. And being able to voice our opinions and to fight for our rights when they are infringed upon, that is a fundamental uh, part of being an adult and of being uh, a member of society. So this is the this is the the plea that I'm that I'm leaving you with um, from my own experience. So just be open, listen to to school students and to their representatives, and try to support them as much as you can um, by using the following the following tools. So now we're going to talk talk a bit about what are the do's and don'ts of school student participation from a teacher's view. So basically, um, from what I've encountered in these past five years at all levels. I've put together a few pieces of advice that I that I can uh, I can give you uh, in terms of what are the things that actually help students become activists and to fight for their rights and to fight for a better school community, and what are the things that interfere with with their self organizing processes and with their um, um, with their involvement in in school democracy and in school activism. So a few of the don'ts, a few of the do's actually, because we're going to start with the do's first. What you can do. First of all, support school students to self-organize. So someone said in the Mentimeter earlier, and that's that's an amazing example. Someone said, a teacher said that uh, whenever there's an issue in the school, they encourage their students to raise their voice or to take up a petition or file a letter with, with a school administration to address that issue and to actually show the principal or the school board that school students care about those issues and that they are involved in, in, in solving them actively. So um, basically what, what this means is that whenever your students uh, raise an issue, and it might be a very serious issue, um, either that, I don't know, the, the school budget does not cover the price of heating and that is, uh, um, they have to to suffer in the cold during the during classes, or that school transportation is not available to them and they don't, cannot get to school because they cannot afford it, or that uh, their school allowances or any any other kind of of support money they might receive from the school is not being paid. So it can be very very serious issues like this, where like these, where it might even be something like uh, the fact that their breaks are way too short and they don't have time to go to the bathroom or to eat their lunch or to actually. Um, just take a deep breath and relax for a bit before the second before the next class starts. So it can be all sorts of issues and it's very, very important. And this is what I'm what I'm um, what my plea is uh, for you not to dismiss, not to, to dismiss the issues that they encounter because we were you were all um, students once and you know just how hurtful and how um, annoying at, at, at times can be for your teachers not to listen to you and not to understand what you're trying to convey and not to actually treat you as an adult in the making and as an um, yeah as a as a um, as a citizen in the making so support school students self organize again inform them inform them on, on what their rights are and what their uh, what uh, what they can do to reach the school administration they can file petitions letters protests campaigns so they can take all sorts of, of forms and and um, forms and shapes. Um, and I realize I just said protest and that might for some of you be a bit too much or be where the, 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 the line is crossed. But we shouldn't forget that um, oftentimes protests are a great way to make your voice heard and to to advocate for what you believe in and to make your your uh, um, your voice heard for those who are in power. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, a protest that disrupts the school hours or the classes or what or anything. It can just be a, a peaceful protest, but I can guarantee that um, should a protest take place, it will definitely bring some at attention to the issues that you would like to raise. And why not? Maybe you can also uh, also join your students in that protest and also encourage your your fellow teachers to to join as well. If it's an issue that affects you all and which you really want to to uh, put an end to. 
The second one is advocate for their participation and decision making bodies within the school. This is fairly straightforward. So if you're a teacher who is engaged with the school board, with, with the school administration, and you see that there are no, no students at the table when decisions are being made that affect them, speak up. Say this is not OK. We're talking about our students. We're making decisions. Apologies. We're making decisions for our students. We're talking about them, so they should be at the table. They should have a say at the table. They should have, they should have a, a say in, in matters that concern them. And they should have a vote on these issues. So this is, this is also what you can do. You can ask the school administration. You can ask the school board to include students and demand that they include students in decision making processes um, at, at the level of the of the school. Um, and this is um, going to mean a lot more coming from you as teachers, as respected members of the school community, and of course everything that, that comes with that, um, than it might be when it comes from, um, from a student. Because if a school doesn't listen to students um, in the first place, it's highly unlikely that they will listen to them when they ask for a place at the table. Um, OK, uh, offer them spaces to make their voices heard in the classroom and this and that's why I told you that I'm, I'm very, very happy that uh, the Mentimeter results have shown this and that you actually do that because it's so important to create a safe space in the classroom where your students actually feel like they can ask you questions and they can say if they haven't understood something because I'm sure that um, most of you are frustrated sometimes with the fact that your students might be a bit inactive or you feel like they're not listening to you or, or they're on their phones all the time or whatnot. So the way to solve this is to actually get them engaged in whatever you're teaching, be it you're teaching science or mathematics or uh, languages or literature, get them engaged, have debates, uh, talk with them, make sure that they're actually in the classroom with you. That is so important. It actually empowers them to um, voice their opinions and to ask the questions and say if they haven't understood something um, in the moment. And it also gives them a bit of courage to um, speak up further on as well in their life. So, um, yeah, it, it, it can really make a very big difference. I had a teacher when I was in high school who always in, in encouraged us to, to ask questions and to get us to think and get our, our gears grinding. And if no one had a question, our teacher would ask us a question to sort of get a debate going on. So, and these are almost the only classes I remember from my entire, from all of my years of high school. So just so you know what a difference it makes in the long term for, for school students. Um, empower them to get involved in the school community. This again is, is very important because coming from you uh, and actually encouraging them to, um, you know, run for uh, positions in the students council or run for positions in the school board if there are such positions available for students. That can actually encourage them to do it and coming from you um, it might actually make a difference from them and actually convince them to go that extra step go, go that um, extra uh, step and get involved in, in the school community um, in any way or form or um, um, or body that you might have at a, at a school level and now the don'ts so as I was telling you earlier, do not, and I, I'm, I'm begging you, do not influence their decision making processes. So help them set up their organizations, make sure that they have um, the resources they need or whatnot, but do not take part in their meetings if they do not feel comfortable with you doing so. Do not try to influence their decision making processes by feeding them your arguments or by telling them your opinion and trying to imply that this is the only right opinion um, because students are at the end um, still growing and still uh, in their in their formation years so they could be easily influenceable but if you do this and if you actually influence their decisions then you haven't done anything so you haven't helped your students at all all you've done is just um, impose your views on the students council or on the students representatives and um, yeah basically that did nothing, unfortunately, at the end of the day. Another don't is do not promote tokenism. So um, I don't know if um, most of you know what tokenism means. Basically, it is a form of having school students or stakeholders participate in decision making processes just so you could say that they were there. So, for example, in, in a school board meeting, you call um, a student to come sit in that meeting so you can say that Oh, we consulted school students or we talked to school students. Um, 
when in fact that student didn't say a word, a word during the entire meeting. So it's very important to make sure that student participation is actually meaningful, that it actually contributes to, to the decisions that are being made, and that the, the um, students' point of view and what students have to say actually matter towards the final decision, and they actually make a difference for the final decision which is being, uh, which is being made. And last but not least, do not preclude them from making their voices heard. So this is the worst thing you can do. Um, that being uh, either forbidding students' council or forbidding students for, for running for students' council um, or trying to shush students up when they try to voice their opinions or not encouraging them to, to voice their opinions in, in your classroom. Um, this all means that you're precluding them from making their voices heard. And it might not seem like um, a very big deal for you in the moment, but for a school student, for what is in the end a teenager, to feel like they are silenced and that their opinions don't, don't matter will have a, a great, great, great impact um, further along in their life. So it will turn them into a citizen that doesn't care about politics, that doesn't care about um, how things, how, how a country is being, is being run. And in the end, this has an impact on the entire society. Um, because, you know, we go out and vote for politicians less and less. So the voter turnout rates are, are, are lower and lower. And this is precisely because some, um, some citizens, some adults who were once school students who do not have their opinions heard, they feel in their subconscious that their opinions don't matter. And what they have to say doesn't matter in reality. And this is also um, something I've heard oftentimes from, from adults. Um, that I'm not going to go out and, to, and, and vote because it makes no difference. I'm not going to say that this is not going wrong because it makes no difference. Well, I don't know if you need to hear this right now, but as a school student representative that has had meetings with governments and had meetings with the Minister of Education, I can tell you that voicing your opinion constantly and voicing your, your um, whatever issues you might come across in your um, um, in your careers uh, and empowering your students to do the same thing can actually make a difference. It can change laws, it can change policies, it can change paradigms and ways uh, ways of thinking, so it can actually truly make a difference. And I think you really need to hear this and to, to, to acknowledge this and to understand this, that your work and your school students work and their activism can truly make a difference in your school, in your um, local community, or maybe even at a national level, um, as as I did once, even though um, not a lot of people believe that I could. So everything is possible if you have just a tiny bit of faith in your students. So to conclude, um, what do we what do we take away from this? Um, First of all, support school students to self-organize, stand for their rights to participate in decision-making processes. So when no one thinks that students should be at the table, be that person that says, no, we are talking about them. We're talking about our students. They should have a say in the final decision. They should have a say in what we're going to decide and what we are going to decide for them. So advocate and ask constantly and make sure that there are students at the table because otherwise, um, if, um, because we are a community at a school level, right? We're, we're teachers, we're school students, we're, we're parents. Um, so if one of us suffers and if one of us is excluded from the table, be it students, be it teachers, be it parents, it won't be too long before um, the school board or the school administration might see that there's not really a community at all. And they're going to to um, care even less about hearing the opinions of the stakeholders. So if you don't encourage your students to make their voices heard, and if you don't fight for their right to speak at the table as main beneficiaries of, of what is going on in the school and of the education process, basically, you might want to realize that democracy in your school um, is decaying by the day. Uh, and at one point, you might even find yourself kicked out of, of these kinds of uh, um, of these kinds of um, uh, meetings. Uh, and yes, condemn tokenism whenever you encounter it. And I, I've seen that in the, in, the, in the chat. This has sparked quite a bit of a debate what tokenism means. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, it's 
you, you got to the meaning of it basically. What it means is um, having stakeholders, for example, students, teachers, parents at the table where decisions are taken uh, without them have actually having something to say in the final in the final decision. So just having students at the table, for example, just to say, oh yeah, we've consulted with students and we've uh, asked students what they want, but it's not actually meaningful and it's not actually um, caring for, for, the, for the students' uh, opinions at all. Uh, so yes, this was pretty much uh, what I what I had to talk to you about. Um, I think we can. Uh, but yes, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass yes. it uh, back to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Radesh. Thank you for this great presentation. I'm sure I can state this on the behalf of all the participants. Uh, more than one teacher in the chat said that it was really really useful to hear all this from a student's point of view, of course. And I think you really managed to combine your personal experience with uh, wider practices, uh, highlighting really how teachers can play a key role in enabling the students to self-organize and fight for their rights. So I think um, it was a really great presentation and it was also nice that the participants had the opportunity to opportunity to express themselves in the chat and contribute bringing some experience uh, um, as well. Uh, actually, a nice interaction and a nice conversation uh, is uh, being created in the chat. Um, and of course, thank you very much, Eleonora, for uh, for supporting us uh, from a technical point of view during the presentation. But definitely now I would like to leave some time for, for the questions. We have uh, actually some questions, so I'm going to read them out loud for you so you can reply. OK, is that OK? Uh, so the first one is, uh, do you have experiences with students' involvement in decision making at primary school or even pre-primary age? Yes, so um, basically in, in, um, in the work we've done so far with, with uh, school students' involvement, um, we've worked with frameworks for involvement of, of students uh, in primary and pre-primary education. Um, and of course, the mechanisms for getting uh, students or pupils involved at those levels are widely different than at a primary or uh, than at a, sorry than at a secondary or upper upper secondary um, school level. So what we've seen is that um, when talking about um, um, pupils or um, children who attend kindergarten, for example. Um, these democratic processes have to be very more, uh, very much so simplistic. For example, um, if they also have lunch at school uh, provided by the school, maybe um, you can do uh, some sort of elections weekly. So you can do an election when they have to decide on what they would like to eat for lunch between, I don't know, a, a cupcake and a, a cheesecake or something of the sort for dessert. Um, or also getting them to, to um, what I'm thinking of right now and what I've paused is, is because I've thought of something that uh, someone said in the chat and that is that the key behind all of this and behind students participation is to actually truly listen to students opinions and I think that this applies in the, in the primary and pre-primary um, stage as well that meaning that of course you're not going to address the same issue that you're going to address at the secondary school level so we're not going to talk about the budget or having pre-primary school students on on the school board but you can start up conversations in the in the classroom for example um those which, which conversation which can develop the the rights of these pupils to uh the the yeah the um can develop the ability of school students to make a choice and to voice their opinions for example, when it comes in, in their schedule, uh, like their timetables or their um, when they should take a break or again, what they would like to eat for lunch or where they would like to go for the classroom trip um, or what they would like to, to talk about in today's arts class or science class or um, practical abilities or whatever it's called when you draw or uh, or paint and, and everything of the sort. So it's there are ways to actually listen to your students regardless of their age. And there might, um, um, as teacher, you might actually be surprised to um, see how often school students or pupils or um, children who attend kindergarten have something to say. Of course, at very different degrees, degrees of complexity, but if you actually create a space in which students feel like um, you care about their opinions and you care about what they have to say, 
not only are they going to be more open towards starting these conversations themselves, but also they're going to have a lot more trust in you um, when having these debates in the classroom, and they're going to be a bit um, a bit more more honest um, in in uh, in such debates. And I saw that someone said um, uh, earlier about how can school students be if I, if I may mark that because it, it sort of ties into this uh, about how school students can be encouraged to voice their opinions without teachers when some of them don't do that ever. So when they're on their own. Um, the thing is, of course, when your entire life or when your entire school uh, career as a school student, no one listened to your opinions and no one told you that what you what you think and what you are saying matters. It can be a bit tough at first to actually develop this exercise and to actually understand that, again, your opinion matters and that the classroom is a safe space for sharing your opinions and for sharing issues that, you, that concern you. So if you're a teacher that is trying to, to start a conversation in the classroom and is starting to create a safe space for your students, for them to voice their opinions, and at first they're a bit reticent or they, you feel like they're not really engaged in what you're talking about or in what you're saying, what the advice that I can give you is just keep going. So keep sparking these conversations, maybe with topics that might be a bit closer to their heart. So I don't know, not at first about, uh, I don't know, teacher salaries or how the educational system looks like and uh, things of the sort, but with topics which might be a bit closer to them. For example, if they feel like what you're teaching them is relevant for them in this age, or if they feel like, um, if they feel safe in the school, if they feel like their well-being is taken into account in the school space, so there are a lot of a lot of mild issues you can start with to actually create the culture of dialogue in the classroom. But if you need to hear this, hear this. It is a sustained effort, so it takes time to build this relationship of trust with your school students, with your students in general. But it's it's worth it. At the end of the day, I really think it's worth it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rarish. I think it's really important what you said at the beginning regarding the primary and pre-primary school because teachers need to know that. This can be actually applied also at uh, early stages. Uh, the thing is uh, just about creating, as you said, the right environment for pupils to to communicate it, to express themselves, of course, uh, on different issues uh, and uh, and problems. Um, there is uh, uh, another question uh, for you. Uh, given what you said toward the end, shouldn't teacher guide support students in their activism, especially in an early stage of their self-organization? Is that considered to influence them as well? Uh, <laughs> that's a very, very, very good question. Um, yes, Thank of you. course. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I don't know really who, who posted it. Uh, congratulations. Um, yes, it's a very good question. And um, of course, because that's uh, what this entire webinar basically has been about, about supporting school students in the first stages and actually helping them get involved um, in school democracy and in school students' councils and everything. Um, but I think we have to think about what this support actually means. So in my opinion, the acceptable support that, that teachers can offer students is, again, um, opening the classroom and being very open about having conversation in, in the classroom about issues that concern them, of course, without affecting the teaching process and everything, but this is, um, of course, implied. But having this conversation in the classroom and by doing this, encouraging students to speak up, you know, first at the classroom level, then if they have issues that are at a school level, or maybe even further, um, and through every step of this of this process, because I think this is what your, your question was pointing towards. Um, yes, yeah, school students need support, but this is only if like at a certain point when they actually start getting involved and they start taking part in, in school students meetings and they start uh, attending meetings of the school board or um, um, yeah, fighting petitions and having campaigns and everything, you can still support them. But oftentimes it's better to support them after they developed and becomes students activists, it's better if you support them, especially when they ask for it. Um, because your support is very much appreciated, especially in the early stages. So getting them, make, helping them understand how society works and why it's important to get involved and actually giving them the essence of that spirit of, of, of democracy and of uh, being a part of a community. Uh, but then what they do later on um, and I can tell you that as, as a former school student representative at a school level, 
is very much so tied to their own learning process. So even if they might make mistakes, even if they might, you know, screw up a couple of times here and there, that is part of their learning process. And I think it's it's important to to remember that and to uh, to respect the fact that even though all of us have different learning processes and we we learn in very different ways, um, there are our own ways to learn, and we should be um, yeah, we should get credit for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rares. Uh, I'll take just two seconds to inform the participants that we are approaching the end of the webinar and we have posted the link uh, to the feedback form in the chat. So do not forget, please, to save it and uh, complete it after after the webinar. And maybe, Rares, if you if you have time, I have one more question uh, that I think is really, really relevant uh, considering the, the time we are living and is actually how can teachers provide um, the mentorship online, can do all of these online uh, given the current circumstances? That's a great question, thank you. Um, well, most of us, of course, and even maybe people who are here in this webinar after an hour of being here are already tired of hearing us and looking at the screen. Um, so we we very much know you know uh, about Zoom fatigue, about Google Meet fatigue. So being in meetings all day and not having the willingness to to do any more online meetings. But in this context of school activism, um, I think we can see this as an opportunity. So for example, if um, before COVID and before we started doing online classes and having contact with our teachers online, um, before this, um, being in contact with your teachers meant staying um, in class after after class finished or having a chat with them uh, between in, in your breaks which might have been annoying for both teachers and school students because they had to to use their break to raise an issue or to talk a bit more about what happened during the class so what can what you can do is um, have separate sessions with them so maybe i don't know um, a bit later in the afternoon after you've had lunch and everything you can have a session with your students where you just you just talk about issues that concern them and you just have a debate about a certain topic or you can uh, watch a movie or as someone else said you can have a TED, you can watch a TED talk for example because there are a lot of TED talks on very um, important matters and then you can um, talk about the arguments of the person who had a, who had the TED talk um, um, and see if they fit with their arguments or they, they think differently so it's it's mostly just about having a dialogue, a real honest dialogue with your students. This is the key of it. And it's, it's, um, it might be a bit complicated or they might be a bit disengaged at, at first, uh, or you might not even be able to engage all of your students. And that's perfectly natural because not all of them are interested in this. And again, that is, that is okay and it's understandable at the end of the day. Um, but even those five, 10, 15 students that we managed to bring together, just know that you are making a difference for them. And if you feel like it doesn't matter anymore or that you can't keep going anymore, remember that for those students which you have empowered, you really are making a difference. And that's uh, a very good reason to, to keep going. Once again, thank you. Thank you, Rares, uh, for, for the, the whole presentation and then for addressing all the questions that we had from the teachers, uh, I, I think uh, it was uh, was really inspiring and useful uh, for, for everyone. And I would like to remind all the participants that you will have all the material, the presentation and the recording available after the webinar on the webinar page. Um, one last practical information uh, for the participants. First of all, I uh, remind you to save the link to the feedback form and second uh, I would like to inform you that no certificates are issued for this webinar. So we are we are really approaching the end now and uh, thank you Rares, thank you Eleonora for supporting us uh, in the background and uh, I would like to leave you the floor <laughs> to you for a last uh, comment uh, for our participants Rares. Uh, yes, so as the last as the last word, um, well, last couple of words, actually. Um, I thank you once again for taking part in this uh, in this webinar. Thank you for being here. Thank you for showing interest in this. So as I told you, the first step has been done. The fact that you're interested in this and that you actually care about supporting your students. 
Um, and yeah, what, what can I what can I say? So if you've done this before, if you've encouraged your students to take action and to get involved before, congratulations, keep going. And if you haven't, um, then all I can tell you is um it's it might be a tough journey at first but at the end of the day it will be worth it because you really are changing lives and to be honest um in my opinion that's what being a teacher is all about changing lives and shaping minds that's great um i think there is a lot of food for thought so uh, i would like to wish you all a good evening and see you for uh, for the next webinar uh, next month bye bye everyone thank you very much for joining us today